Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mike Lagerquist. I work at Vine Faith in Action. And today I have double duty, well, triple duty, if you think, realize that I'm also operating the Zoom machine here. So I've got that going on. And I am today's presenter because on Labor Day weekend, I went down to Kansas City where my brother and his family have lived for almost 40 years now. They moved down there, or Steve moved down there in January of 1981 to start working or to going to school. And now he works for Garmin down there as their global resources manager. So he buys all the little pieces that go into the, the products that you buy from Garmin. But uh, because he had kids all this time, my oldest niece is 36 years old. We never really went out and explored any of the great sites that Kansas City has to offer. So when I was down there on Labor Day weekend, on the uh, recommendation of a friend, we went to, and there are various names for it, but I'm just gonna stick with the Arabia Steamboat Museum, which is down at the city market right downtown. You'll learn from, uh, from our guest today, it's a recording of the, from the owner of the museum, that they were able to get this property inexpensively when they first uh, started the museum because it was in kind of a rundown area. It's much nicer now with the city market being at the center of it because after we went there, we hopped onto the streetcar and took that several blocks down to the Union um, Station, the old railroad station where they've got a railroad, uh, um, miniature railroad display and right across from that is actually the World War II Museum where we will try to get to next time. We just didn't have the time now, just a little over a month ago, if even, yeah, if even that, uh, but uh, a little nicer then than it was now. But what I'm gonna try to do is just give a little bit of a, a start with some history about steamboats on the Mississippi and the Missouri and a little bit about the steamboat Arabia, which we will be talking about. Then I will switch back and start up a video recording that I did with David Hawley. He and his brother and father were the ones who discovered uh, about the Arabia, were able to find where it sunk, and then led the expedition basically to recover everything that was on the boat. So this was back in, I believe, what was it? late 80s, early 90s, that this took place. And then after that, we'll just go back, come back here and I can show you some of the pictures of the things that Dave talked about that are on display at the museum. And we'll just uh, wrap things up with a little bit of a, a look at the museum itself. You'll also see that Dave is quite the salesman. He will invite you to come down and see the museum yourself if you would like to at any time. They were open with uh, the COVID situations. We wore masks and let's see, I was, mine was fourteen fifty to get in. My brother who just turned 60 had a senior discount. So he was thirteen fifty to get in, but uh, it is at least a two hour excursion in there. And the great thing is you've got the other stores and restaurants of the city market right outside the door. So I am going to try right now, see if I can do this. PowerPoint that I need to start. Let me see if I, can, I can do that this way. We'll start this and then share the screen. Are you folks seeing the, the first slide? Yes. Yes, good. I realize I've got you all muted, so I'm glad a couple of you nodded. But this is the, the entrance to the, as you can see, it's the Treasures of the Steamboat Arabia Museum. And as you enter here, uh, what you do is you go in, there's a registration counter right here. And then as you go in, there is a kind of a, a ramp that goes downstairs. As you're going through that ramp to get to the exhibits, you're going past large monitors that are telling the story of the Arabia uh, so you have a good background of what you're going to see once you get down there. And all right, well, this is kind of a grainy picture, but this is the, the Steamboat Arabia. It was also called the, the White Arabia, as you can see why. But the, 
Here's some background information that I found. The Missouri River always had been a nightmare from a navigational standpoint, seldom holding enough of its muddy water for safe navigation. You know, it, it has, it's called the Muddy Missouri for a reason. Uh, nevertheless, it was an important route for settlers on the westward expansion. And of course, the Mississippi, or excuse me, the Missouri River also played an important role in the Lewis and Clark expedition. The first steamboat up the Missouri River, called the Independence, ran from St. Louis to the vicinity of the Cheriton River as early as 1819. The second boat up the river was the Western Engineer, which made it almost up to the Yellowstone River. It was a journey of almost three months one way. And here's a quote that I found. The Missouri River was notorious for eating boats, Captain Steve Terry said. The average lifespan of a newly built steamboat back in Sam Clements's time was two years. I believe David said, Dave said that uh, the Arabia was three years old. I think he quoted as saying that five years was the average age, so that may have been overall. Uh, but on the, Mississippi was, on the Mississippi River was four to five years. So there were about 289 steamboats that sank or possibly more on the Missouri River in the mid 19th century. So you can see it really was notorious for eating uh, steamboats. One of the reasons was it was fairly shallow. So the boats weren't always able to, to get through there, but the steamboat Arabia was built in West Brownsville, Pennsylvania at the boatyard of John S. Pringle in 1853. It traveled the Ohio and Mississippi rivers before it was bought by Captain John Shaw who operated it on the Missouri River. Its first trip was to carry 109 soldiers from Fort Leavenworth to Fort Pierre, which was located upriver in South Dakota. It then traveled up the Yellowstone River, adding 700 miles to the trip. In all, the trip took nearly three months to complete. In March 1856, the Arabia was sold to Captain William Terrell and William Boyd, and it made 14 trips up and down the Missouri during their ownership. In March, it collided with an obstacle, either a rock or a sandbar, nearly sinking with a damaged rudder. Repairs were made in nearby Portland, and a few weeks later it blew a cylinder head and had to be repaired again. So you can see, even by that time, which was only three years old, it was in pretty rough shape. Everything was uh, breaking down as these two Williams got ownership of it. But also in March of 1856, the Arabia was stopped and searched by pro-slavery border ruffians near Lexington, Missouri. According to newspaper accounts at the time, a Pennsylvania abolitionist aboard the Arabia dropped a letter which was discovered and handed over to Captain Shaw. The letter described guns and cannons en route to the slavery-free Kansas Territory from the abolitionist Massachusetts Aid Society the weapons were discovered in boxes labeled carpenter's tools, and they were confiscated. All right, well, let's see how I can get out of this now. I will stop this share and see, hi Jeremy, and see about, here is Dave Hawley. Uh, let's see, I guess I have to share this again. Oh, those are my notes, which I don't need. Sorry, folks, as I say, I'm doing multiple duty here. So there we go. All right. This gentleman's name, assuming you can see David Hawley now, uh, my brother and I were actually walking through the museum when this gentleman, and you'll see a picture of him at that time, came up to us and asked us if there was any help we needed. Uh, he said he identified himself as Dave and said that he was one of the early people on the crew who did the digging of the, uh, of the boat. I got interested in it a little bit further. I went online and, and did a search for the crew, saw a picture of this guy and I said, well, that's not just a guy, a member of the crew, that's David Hawley who owns the Arabia Museum and was one of the original guys who got started on this. 
So this video is, uh, as you can see, it's about 31 minutes long, but I think it'll go fairly quickly. I've watched it a couple of times now, and I have to say Dave's a pretty interesting guy. I apologize for some of the pauses in action. Uh, mine doesn't always have a real strong signal, and I found that uh, there were pauses as the as a signal got a little bit uh, weak at times. So I am going to start up this video and uh, if you have any questions, I'm not sure how you're going to be able to reach me, but we will get to that in about 31 minutes. So here is David Hawley, uh, the owner of the Arabia Steamboat Museum in Kansas City. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us today. I had the opportunity on Labor Day weekend to go down to Kansas City to visit my brother. And one of the places I wanted to visit at the recommendation of a friend who had been there was the Arabia Steamboat Museum. And it was incredibly intriguing, especially for those of us who are history buffs, who grew up on a, in a town with a river and have heard stories about riverboats. And of course, my brother and I were wandering through the museum and this nice gentleman comes up to us and says, Anything I can help you guys with? I'm, I'm Dave. I was in one of the I was one of the original diggers on the on the Arabia site, and then I went online and found out that he was not only the digger, but he's the owner of the museum and one of those five guys who decided that it was worth digging up a riverboat that had sunk in 1856 to find out what was available. So, Dave, I appreciate your being here with me today and sharing the story of the Arabia Steamboat Museum down at the City Market in Kansas City. How did that all happen? Well, good morning, Mike, and thanks for having me on. It's a, it's a pleasure to see you again, now that you don't have the mask on, and, right. and, uh, and visit with some of your listeners. Um, it's, it's a very unlikely story, I would guess. You know, it's, it's like when you wake up one day, um, your world changes, and you don't really realize it at the time, but it, it does, looking back. Um, what seems like two lifetimes ago, um, my dad and my brother and I was in the heating and air conditioning business. We fixed air conditioners. We fixed furnaces. It was a hot day in July, and uh, on my list of things to go look at was an air conditioner, and I went to a fellow's house and repaired it, just like I do, I had for many years. And um, But going into the house, it was such a strange place. His wall were decorated with pictures of flying saucers and and UFOs and on that wall and Bigfoot on this wall and and then behind on that back wall was maps of rivers and pictures of steamboats and I, I just had to ask the guy what in what in the world is all of this so we explained it all um, that he liked to look for flying saucers and Bigfoot he just knew they were after somewhere um, but he said, you know, I, I, he said, I, I'm intrigued with steamboats too. He says there's an article in an old National Geographic that talked about one, and that was where he got the interest. So I listened to all these stories for a few hours, and then I called my dad on the radio when I was leaving his place. and said, man, you've got to meet me up at the, at the ha uh, hamburger joint. i got to tell you about this guy that I just met and, and all the things he looked for. So dad and Greg, my brother, and, and then pulled into, into the restaurant and slid into a booth. We're having our lunch, and the restaurant owner who we did work for as well came to join us because he saw us sitting out there all settled up talking about something. <clears throat> and so I went through the story of all this and um, they said, Dave, he says, that's, that's really interesting. And no one was really interested in flying saucers or Bigfoot, but they said, if you can go out and find a steamboat, now we'll help you dig it. So I said, I will do that. And so, so the story begins. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. I went to look for library and read about books and found a metal detector that I thought would find one and I started looking for boats. And that was some years ago. Okay, so was it, the Arabia wasn't the initial one necessarily? You said, I'm gonna go find this one. How did you settle on the Arabia? No, I found other boats and that's certainly researched many other boats prior to the Arabia. Um, but, uh, and I looked for boats miles away from here. Uh, from home, you know, and I'd go out and I'd drive for an hour or two hours and search the ground all day and then drive back home because it's, it's, you know, they just don't pop out of the ground everywhere. And so oftentimes you, you may walk for a weeks and weeks and weeks without finding a boat. You know, you've got to get, you've got to get to the, to the library and pull the information about where did it sink and get a clue on, on what boat you're looking for and what year did it go down and did it sink with cargo? Was it going downriver? 
If it's going down river back to St. Louis, it's probably empty, you know, or it's, it's, it's loaded with hemp or, or tobacco or, or buffalo hides or something, mm -hmm. stuff that maybe you wouldn't want to dig. The boats going north were the boats that you would like. Those are the ones that would load with freight all from around the world, you know, in St. Louis, which is where the warehouses were, and from there proceed west um, up the Missouri River. Now, certainly they went north to your part of the world as well on the Mississippi River. Sure. But I live in Kansas City. And so that's a Missouri River story. And, um, and so uh, in, in researching all these boats, there was one boat that it came across. It was called the Arabia that sank in 1856. The newspaper said that it was a large and valuable cargo. It hit a tree and sank very quickly with no loss of life. I'm watching um, they couldn't get to the cargo because it went down into deep water and, and was just swallowed up, it said, by the bottom of the river. And, and it is. It's the bottom of the river is just super soft. And as the water, as the Missouri would walk under the boat, as it sat there on the bottom of the river, it dug a hole that the boat just settled down into. And within just a couple days, it had been just gobbled up. And there was no sign of the boat above the water at all. And there she lay. Hmm. And one of the things that I think so many of our visitors find interesting is that the, is that the Missouri River changes its course. It actually moves, not in a, in a span of someone's life, but in sometimes in just a couple of years, it just moves back and forth. Um, and as it does, it buries these boats and then it leaves them where they lay and that moves over. The Arabia was a half a mile from the present course of the Missouri River. And standing out on that guy's farm, um, there was just, I mean, there was absolutely no hump or low spot, nothing that would indicate that there was a boat that lay there. Um, I was using a metal detector called a magnetometer. And that finds iron, the iron boilers, and engines, and big chunks of iron that are on the boat. And so, um, I told the farmer, and I said, Mr. Landowner, can I look for the boat? He says, yeah, go look. And, and I used the metal detector, found it. And then to confirm that it was, in fact, a boat and how deep it was, we brought a drill rig out on the farm. And we drilled with a three-inch auger down and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And finally, uh, deeper underground, it hit something super hard. And you can feel the whole drill rig shake. And as you pull the drill up out of the ground on the very end of the drill bit was just an absolute handful of um, oak and pines out in dark, stringy, long pieces of, of, of fibery kind of wood. And the pine comes up as chips. It's just little chips of, of blonde wood. So when you find blonde chips of pine and big chunks of long things of oak and a metal and a magnetic signal that's enormous deep in the ground well there's just nothing it could be other than a sunken steamboat the boat was 45 feet underground wow long way down <laughs> that's just crazy and and the uh, the videos that you show at, at the museum shows that you basically use those uh drillings to create the shape of the boat underneath yeah. the the dirt yeah got to know exactly where your boat's at because the hole you're going to dig um, um, it has got to be placed exactly right. And in addition to the hole that you dig, um, if, if I know that a lot of, well, you and your, your listeners have many of us been to the ocean before and you get back onto the beach a little bit. Or she'll say, oh, it's catching. Whatever that means. Kind of a click. Well, can't make a noise. Yeah, that's what she said. It was like a click. Um, yeah. yeah. And you dig in the sand a little bit, you'll hit water there. Even though the ground surface where you're standing is just dry sand. A couple feet below you, it's wet sand. And it's the same way out here on this farm, close to the Missouri River. There's another river that you can't see, and it's underground. And there's, they say, there's more water in the underground river than there is in the Missouri River that you can see. The same is true with the Mississippi. Even if you get back off the course of the river, even half and drill down, you'll still get water there. And that water has to be removed, you know, before we get to it. Otherwise, it's just like the end of the ocean. You dig down, it all kind of continues to spill back in. 
So we put 20 wells all the way around that boat. The wells went into the ground all the way down to bedrock, 70 feet deep. And we pumped 1,000 gallons of water per minute, per pump, 24 hours for the four months that we dug. We pumped 20,000 gallons of water per minute through that full course. But it pumped faster water into the earth, into the And so the result, the, the, we bent the water table. So when we dug, we dug into ground that was dry and not, you know, not, you know, filled with water. So um, it worked. And we began to dig, not in the spring and the summer, when it was nice and warm outside. We dug instead when it was cold outside. It started in November. And the farmer, I remember, his name was Norman. He said, Dave, don't dig in the winter. It's so bitter cold out here. Wait until spring. But that's the worst time to dig. It rains and the river floods and the, the artifacts don't like the heat of summer. So we started when it was cold. And as we dug, it, as it turned out, it was a bitter freezing cold winter uh, that year. And the walls of the dig would freeze back in. And that helped to stabilize the earth. So we didn't cave in on us as we dug. We dug a hole that was the size of a football field. It was 300 feet long, 200 feet wide, and 45 feet deep. And when we got it completed, at the very bottom of the hole was the boat. You could see the big boilers, the paddle wheels, the front, the back. And, and as the newspaper said, it was, it was a large, I mean, it was filled to the, to the brim with cargo from one end clear to the other. 171 feet long boat, full of freight, on its way to 16 towns out west. And the reports say what, 200 tons of yeah, the Arabia freight? could carry 222 tons of freight. So we just say it's 200 tons. It was a little over that actually, and it was things from all around the world, Mike. Um, there was perfume that came from France. There was brandy cherries that came from France. There was tr Indian trade beads that were made in Czechoslovakia, Bohemia, and Italy. Um, there was tobacco from South America. Um, there, was, there was perfume that, that also came from France. And from the Orient, we found bolts of silk that had come all the way across the Silk Roads, and across the ocean, and up the Mississippi River. All of this to be lost, you know, on a day in September of 1856. Um, buried for 132 years wow. in the mud and in the water. You would have thought it would have rotted away. But at that depth, with, without oxygen or sunlight, covered with water as it was, um, there was no air down there. And without the air, the bacteria wouldn't grow. So things didn't rot, things did not decay. Um, we found barrels of butter, still smell fresh. <laughs> We found jars of pickles um, that still, I mean, you can still eat the pickles brilliantly great. Bottles of pie fillings, apples, and gooseberries, mm -hmm. and cherries, and blueberries, and things you can make pies with. And even when we found the iron, um, there was no rust because it takes air for metal to yeah. rust. But without the air, we could take pocket knives, still cut with pocket knives, and, or uh, scissors rather, and open up pocket knives. And, and you know, I mean, just, just remarkably well preserved. So, yeah, so, um, so as visitors to the collection now, they look at these things that have been cleaned and on display, and they do not look like they were ever wet. No. No, I mean even down to the to the spools of rope that are on the on the shelves, they look like they were just pulled off the shelf down at the Ace Hardware. Uh huh. Yeah, it's very deceivingly uh, well preserved. Now. We do have a display case down there. Remember where the lab is at. Uh, one of the mm -hmm. things we have in the museum is a working lab because we're still cleaning artifacts. After all of these years, it's been 30 years since we dug this boat, but we still have years to go of cleaning this stuff. It takes forever. Um, but we have a display case right there of the before and the after. Things that came up out of the ground that we did not clean, they still are, you know, and when you would find iron, it would come from the ground in really good shape, but as soon as it hit the air, it started to rust. And so we just left things as we found them, still encased in crud and sand and, you know, yucky looking stuff. But that's truly is what it looked like, what we started with when we first brought it out. It cleans off great, 
You know, it's yeah. wonderful underneath, but I can look at it. And you think, oh my gosh, this is going to be impossible. One of the things I love is the uh, the keg of nails yeah. that's all rusted together and still holds the shape of the keg just sitting there on its yeah. own. Yeah, they kind of clumped together, you know, underneath the ground like they did. And so when we took the, the, the barrels apart, they just stayed up. And it wasn't long until they just said sort of rusted together because they, when they were in the air, they had rust. And so at this point, you'd have a really difficult time breaking that apart and cleaning each name. I suppose we could if we really, really wanted to, but we found lots and lots of cakes and nails that we've already cleaned, and those are scattered about in different places. You'll see them, but so we left a few of them just as we found them. It's kind of fun. Yeah, and, and what's nice is, like, as you mentioned, the, the boat held the, the cargo that was going out to frontier towns, so people were establishing, in some cases, building homes. So you've got displays of you know blank keys and doorknobs, and cloth and decorative uh, items for the for the clothing and what what are some of the items that were found that that you just uh, you remember because they were just so stunning or so representative of the time oh you know some of my favorite things a lot of people ask well dave in this whole giant collection of stuff um what is your favorite and growing up i i love photography the museum pictures throughout the museum I took while we were digging. Mm. And uh, we found those, those cases of pie fillings that I talked about earlier, brilliantly colored. I mean, the blueberries just sparkled and the cherries were bright red. And so, you know, you got to get a picture of those. So I did, I took photographs of them and I was shooting slides, little tr transparency. So it takes a few days to send them in to get it back. But when I got it back, I was looking at those. And I thought, I bet that's the first color photograph that any photographer has ever taken of pre-Civil War fruit in color. Okay. It don't exist in the world today. So to get that shot, you'd have to time travel. And digging up the steamboat was much like time traveling back to a time that was 100 years, 100 and some years before us. So I remember that um, as being quite an interesting thing. Found the tree that sank the boat. That was still sticking in the boat as well. It's a walnut tree. It, it wasn't, it's a piece, what, maybe seven or eight feet long, six, seven, eight feet long, six or seven feet long. But that was not the whole tree, certainly. Nor was it just floating down the river and hit the boat like a, like a torpedo. Um, the, the tree itself, many years earlier, had washed from the bank as the river changed its course and that tree was growing along the bank, fell into the river, and the, rust, the roots would drag along as the, with, the, with the current of the river until finally it would get stuck on something, and there it sat at an angle with the, the tree um, at water level, and the oxygen and the water, the thing in the air, rotted off. The tree under the water remained intact and very strong because it was separated from air. And, and that's what sank these boats, these trees that the pilots couldn't see because the Missouri is, is a prettier river, not polluted, but filled with sediment, unlike the Mississippi, which is relatively clean um, in that regard. And so the pilots on the Missouri couldn't see these big trees that run into them from time to time, and the trees would, then, would just go right up inside the boat and poke a hole, and it would sink them. On the Missouri River, there's between three and 400 sunken steamboats, and 75% of them sank in that very way. Well, this, this particular tree penetrated the Arabia, broke, and, and as we were down in there cleaning the artifacts out, there was the tree side of the boat. So we've got that on display as well. And I know you, you listed as the largest collection of pre-Civil War artifacts anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, you won't find a larger collection of, of things that came from a single source. Now, yeah, you can go to the Smithsonian and see a lot of things, but even they don't have a collection, a single collection like the Arabia. Um, boots and shoes, we found about 4,000 of them. Uh, little buttons, the calico buttons, colorful, beautiful things, thousands and thousands of those. Little white buttons, brass buttons, even found rubber buttons. In fact, <clears throat> we were 
you know, stepping back in our story a little bit, my dad and I and Greg were the heating and air conditioning guys. Jerry was the restaurant guy. We had another partner named Dave Latrell who was in the construction business. So none of us were archeologists or nor historians. And as we dug on, we would, we would ask ourselves and each other, what do you think we'll find first? I mean, what will be the first thing we'll find on this boat? We know it was a really old boat and we knew that we didn't know a lot about this kind of stuff. And when we, when we found whatever it was, would we even recognize what that item was? Well, it took us two weeks of digging to finally reach the deck of the boat. Certainly didn't have it all uncovered by then, but we found just a part of the very back. And as we begin to wash the mud off, there was the very first artifact. It was a black shoe laying on the deck. So we picked it up. I mean, everybody circled around at the machine, stopped, the dozer stopped. We circled around and picked this thing up and began to wash it off because it was the first thing after all. And as we washed it, we realized this little shoe, a uh, little black shoe was not made out of leather like we thought it would be, it was made of rubber. And on the bottom of it, as we washed that off, the name of the company that made it was printed right on the bottom of the shoe, it said the Goodyear Rubber Company. And the first thought was, we've dug the wrong boat. How could, an eight, how could a rubber shoe find its way onto a pre-Civil War boat? But they were making rubber shoes by the late 1840s, rubber products. So we found hundreds of rubber shoes and rubber whips and buttons and bobby pins and all kinds of rubber products. It's the oldest in the world, we're told. Wow. Um, so yeah, housewares, tinware, fabrics, food products, um, saws and axes and cutting things, things to build homes with. In fact, we found two prefab homes, homes that have been really? pre-cut and, and it was a kid house. You could buy a kid house. Hmm. The how the remember on on the uh, upper plains in Missouri in the, or in the Midwest, there weren't a lot of forests back then. It was hmm. just prairie. And so, if you wanted a home up there, where you're going to get lumber, you shipped up a house all pre-built um, or pre-cut, and you take it off the boat as a kit, and then you would build it. So we found two of those on the way to a town called Logan, Nebraska. Oh, really? Well, wonderful, yeah, because it must be great because you you have all of the uh, the paperwork and such that goes with these items as well as the items themselves. Yeah. Well, in some cases, most of the paper had dissolved. Now, the paper that we found was research we pulled from libraries and such things. In the water, separated from air, a lot of things remained remarkably well preserved, but the things that would dissolve did. So things in your kitchen at home, like sugar and flour, things that would dissolve, weren't there anymore. Um, we found boxes that said um, chocolates. Well, the chocolates would dissolve. Um, we found uh, that said playing, playing the paper, books, the books would dissolve. The, the covers were there, but the paper was gone. So letters and diaries and such things, most of that was, didn't exist. Um, on rare occasions, we'd find some, like in the dishes. You know, if you move today, you'll take a dish, newspaper down and another dish and keep them, stack them up that way to keep them from scratching. And they shipped them that way as well. We could lift it out of those old boxes and still reprint. The letters were still legible. But the paper itself was like trying to pick up a wet napkin. It, it would just peel and you could take a photograph of it. That's all you could do. Okay. And I also like the, uh, the panes of glass for windows. You guys actually yeah. recreated one of the, the, the windows that you can look through, but just boxes of the, the panes of glass yeah. ready to be used in a house. Yeah. Yeah, and if you had panes in your house, you were a pretty wealthy person back then. That, that was kind of a big deal. A lot of those folks back in the day had um, a, a, something called an oil cloth, would let the light through, not necessarily the wind. I don't know what they did in the winter season. I think they poured it up, I guess. But to have panels of glass in your home was, was kind of a neat thing. Um, but yeah, we found lots and lots of glass in boxes, uh, eight by pen and it, the box it said said New York so it had come from there so we built them into windows so you can have a sense of what you know window shopping on the frontier might have been like 
Now, with something like a, a find like that, it would have been very easy to take and put on the market and try to sell. You guys opted not to do that. You created this, this museum. What went into the, the thinking of that? And thank you for doing that, by the way. You're welcome. Well, I don't know. You know, I guess we could have sold it. We could have, you know. Um, we, we did not dig the boat to do a museum. We didn't. We just thought it would be fun. You know, it would be an adventure. We didn't think it would cost very much. Wouldn't take very long. We certainly didn't anticipate doing a museum and being involved with it for the for years and years and years. Um, but I remember as we dug, someone would pick something out of the mud and say, "Look at this! I, I've seen something like this at a museum once." Weeks would go by, and someone would pick up another thing and say, oh, I've, "Look at this! This would be this would be the greatest thing for a museum." And then weeks later, someone finds something equally as neat and they hold it up and say. When we do our museum, this will be really neat. <laughs> so it was sort of this rambling evolution of, of thought. And there was never any single being that said, shall we sell or shall we keep? It was by the time we had done, it was just, well, where are we going to do the museum? And how's that going to look? And how in the world do you even do museums? Um, but we have, over the over the years we've worked on it, we've not sold a thing. It's it's It's... The intact collection of what this steamboat carried to the frontier, 1856. Hmm. You know. and, and and the city market is such a nice location for the museum. I have read something that you're you're possibly going to be changing location in the future. But can you tell me how was that it, that it settled into that location at city market? Yeah, when we first were looking, we looked at all kinds of different places that in, in city on the Kansas side and we had a big building and it needed to be cheap. Um, that part of Kansas City was not particularly um, high rent district back years ago. It was kind of an area that was depressed and no one wanted to be down there. It was really, it was kind of an industrial abandoned place and the city, the, the building that we're in had once been uh, a city market. Well, it is still a city market down there. But the building that we're in was a vegetable wholesale warehouse. Wow. Um, they used the lower level of, of the building to store and clean and, and then bring the produce up and sell it upstairs. And um, so the building was available and it was big and it was cheap. And we needed big and cheap. <laughs> and so even though it was not in a great part of town, we said, we'll rent it. And so we rented the space. and. When we first walked into it, oh my stars, we thought, we'll never fill this thing up. This is an enormous, huge place. But quite the opposite has been the case. We have filled it up now, and we are out of space. And there's another boat I want to dig really bad. It's one called the Malta. It's okay. in Kansas City, about 80 miles. Now, the Arabia collection is, is are, are items going to the settlers? Okay, that were, you know, going west. The Malta in 1841, 15 years before the Arabia, was carrying Indian trade supplies. It was working for a family named Shoto out of St. Louis. And they had an enormous um, enterprise built in the fur trade. It was, they, their, their operation was the, um, the American Fur Company. And they brought fur trade supplies to the trading posts and then gathered the furs and brought them back to St. Louis and then distributed them all around the world into Europe and then New York and such places um, because furs was a high fashion back in the day. Well, this boat sank on its way going north, going to the frontier. So it was, it did not have furs on it. It had all the trinkets, the, the beads and the buttons and the fabrics and all the things that they would have traded to the, to the Indians when it sank and went down. I've, I've located the boat, same way with the metal detector, hmm. and it all outlined and ready to go. Um, farmer's willing to let us dig it and is excited about it. Uh, I just need a bigger building. And I'm just, I just, the, the Arabia is not a big enough place. So I want to combine the Arabia collection of 1856 with the, with the Malta collection, not on the same shelves, but in different, parts of the building so you can view an 1856 collection and go right across the way gallery and see one from the 1840s 
and compare what do shoes look like from one decade to the next? What does clothes look like? And what do the Indians want? And what do the settlers want? Two different stories, both compelling, but that's why we're looking for a bigger building. Okay. Well, I hope it works out and, and is as successful. I'm hoping that the Arabia Museum is successful. You've kept it going for quite some time now, so yeah. there has to be something to be said for that. But uh, uh, is, there, is there anything else, that, Dave, that you want? Here's your chance to be that uh, that promotional guy. Promotional why should guy. why should people come down to the museum? Well, I think that they will enjoy it, and you don't even have to be a museum goer. Most of our people that come and visit the museum are not avid museum enthusiasts. There are people who come that just like a good story. And the, there's movies there, there's the collection there, and I'm there a lot, you know? And if I'm not there, some of the other diggers are. And um, so we're always available to visit and say hi and answer questions. Um, it takes normally a couple of hours, perhaps, to go through the item. We're open seven days a week. You can find us if you want more information. Google us, pretty simple to find. Just Google Arabia Steamboat Museum. Our web address, if you can remember, it's 1856.com. Same here, the boat sank, 1856. That's a, that's a great way to remember it. Uh, there's actually a bank in town here that was established in 1856, and that is still part of its phone number to this day. Okay. That's our phone number, too. Oh, it is? It is a last right. four digits, yeah, 471-1856. All right. Well, great minds think alike. Here we go. All right. Well, thank you, Dave. I appreciate this and, and your willingness to, to come on, get on the line with a, with a Minnesota old newspaper guy. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for visiting the museum and, and providing the opportunity to, to reach out to your, to your viewers. And I hope we'll see all of you come back to the museum at some point. All right. Sounds like a deal. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dan. All right. Well, he's, he's certainly a, a go-getter. There's not going to be a, a chance that people that he's not going to uh, be excited about what's going on. So uh, I hope everybody enjoy that. If you'd like, uh, if you want to let me know, I can share that the link for that with you after this happens. If you want to go back and listen to it again, again, I apologize for those glitches in the uh, in the recording because it just Anytime you've got a, a break in the internet system uh, signal, unfortunately, that's going to happen. So uh, if you like, I will just now go back and uh, rejoin, let's see, rejoin that PowerPoint that I had going on. And we'll see if I can share that. All right, hopefully you're all Seeing that again, you all see the Arabia once again. Mary, can you nod? Let me know. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, all right, let's just move on a little bit. Uh, he was talking about the snag the, that brought down the boat. This is on display, as he mentioned, at the museum. Those are not real gentlemen there, of course, but you can use them as a sense of scale. But it said the most treacherous of the many hazards in the Missouri River were fallen trees lying hidden under sight just under the river's surface. The snags crippled and sank hundreds of steamboats from the 1820s to the 1870s. And interestingly, what I found out was, well, the, the boat's steam boilers consumed approximately 30 cords of wood per day. And since they couldn't store all of that wood on the boat, what they would occasionally do is stop pull over to the shoreline and harvest some wood. And I'm guessing what happened was that once that was taken down, that probably aided the erosion that was taking place along the banks. And that's what happened then when the, when the trunks would find their way into the river, hide underneath the surface and uh, be found when the passing river boats ran into them. And that's exactly what happened in September, I believe, of 1856. The Arabia was there with passengers. As Dave said, all of the passengers survived. Uh, so there were, was no loss of life. You'll see later that there was one casualty. As a matter of fact, here he's, this might be him right here. Uh, there was a mule on board that unfortunately did not survive the trip, but uh, Let's see what we got next here, but oh, he was talking about the path of the Missouri River. 
you can see right now that I'm trying to get the cursor back, but you can see the, the current course of the river goes around here, but the Arabia excavation is here. So evidently at one point, the river made more of a direct route probably across here, but it was intriguing that he said they used old newspaper accounts that told exactly where the Arabia went down. So they were able to, to narrow in quite a bit on the general location and then using the magnetometer were able to zone in. And I have seen some pictures from the, from the site and what, you know, they basically, if you've ever played uh, Battleship, you know, sometimes it seems like you call out the name and you call out all these misses and you see the shape of the boat in the middle that you're that you're aiming for. That's kind of what happened. They just sent down those uh, those holes and sketched out where they didn't hit the boat, and then the area in between all of those was the boat itself. So it was really kind of interesting. This is the crew that they had there at first. This is Dave right down front. That's his brother Greg, and then his dad. And then the, he mentioned, I think this is uh, Luttrell, the, the construction guy. They would not have been, they would have had to rent or buy some heavy equipment if Dave had not come in on board with their expedition and he provided a lot of the excavation equipment. This guy was the, the restaurant owner where they, where they sat that first day and hashed out their plans. Interestingly, I remember hearing somewhere along the way that some of the earliest artifacts that they found, they took and stored in his walk-in freezer. Because as Dave said, when it was exposed both to the temperature and to the air that these artifacts started to deteriorate. So uh, he provided cold storage literally for some of the first artifacts that they, that they found. This is an aerial of the excavation site. You can see they've already pulled out some of the wheels that they found over here. And it's probably some other things. This would, this would have been right up here at the top would have been one of the river boats or the uh, paddle wheels. So you can see the different uh, pieces of the structure of the paddle wheel. This would have been the, the, the front of the boat. I think, uh, is that the stern, the bow or the stern? I, I can never keep that straight. But then on here on the bottom is the other paddle wheel. So they had that on both sides. Uh, again, here you can see the paddle wheels here and here. This was the, uh, the big, the power for the, for the boat that moved it along. And this is not a place where I would have wanted to be, but that's where they were continuing to dig out the, uh, the hole to make the excavation a little bit safer. And I was intrigued by the fact that they mentioned that uh, because it was so cold and th there was still moisture in the, the ground that they were able to, you know, basically protect and create some real solid walls. But it was in the 1860s that Elijah Sorter purchased the property where the Arabia lay. And the, over the years, legends were passed through the family that the Arabia was located somewhere under the land. In the surrounding town, stories were also told of it but exact location of it was lost over time. And then you could see from that map just how the route of the river changed following the Arabia's sinking. And it was in 1957 that Bob Hawley, that's the father, and his sons, Greg and Dave, set out to find the Arabia. They used old maps and proton magnetometer to figure out the, the probable location and finally discovers it half a mile from the modern location of the river under 45 feet of silt and topsoil. As he mentioned, the farmers gave permission for excavation with the condition that the work be completed before the spring planting. planting. So literally, it, it appears most of this took, was done over a, a matter of several months so that they could get back into the field and, and get everything out in order to start with the, uh, start with planting. But this is the, the front of the boat here, guys sitting on that. Uh, and that's Dave, as I saw him the day at the museum. Uh, he does have a shield there in his hands, so he did, he was protected uh, from everybody. But as you can tell, very welcoming guy. And he, uh, I asked him a couple of questions that I'll, 
that I'll share with you as we go in a little bit further in the presentation here. But this is my brother, Steve. Steve was standing there watching uh, off to the, to the left of the screen was a, an informational video that was taking place. Uh, so I, I happened to sit down for the moment and thought getting a picture of the stem stern of the boat would be kind of a nice way to set it up. But this is really what greets you when you come in the museum. As I mentioned, I think this was the second video location. There was one on the way down the stairs that was very, uh, really set the stage and told a lot of the history of steamboats at that time. Uh, the paddle wheels, uh, there, this is in the lobby right there at the, at the lower level. Uh, this is a recreation. The paddle wheels were 28 feet across and averaged five miles per hour when they were going upstream. 171 feet long, as Dave said, the Arabia traveled the Missouri River and transported passengers, as well as carried up to 222 tons of cargo, including tools for the frontier, merchandise for general stores, and federal mail. Uh, nav navigating the Missouri was difficult and dangerous, uh, and all kinds of fun adventures uh, were in front of whoever decided to make that trip. Here, as I said, is the only casualty of the passage. This was a mule. He was found still tied to this piece of the, of the ship. He did not make it, not over 150 years. Uh, he was not able to survive, but you can see the bones and the, and the skull, you know, even a lantern here and a pan and, and cup that they found that uh, helped set the stage for that. Uh, but as Dave said, it was, uh, Arabia was heading out of Kansas City, which meant it was filled with housewares. Although some of the same team or recovery, and they've got some displays of those as well. You can see that most of them look as fresh as the day that they were probably loaded onto the boat in 1856. Uh, this, of course, is a, a Davenport ironstone, so just uh, all just a huge variety of uh, designs and sizes and shapes of housewares that were on. The Arabia. Here's a, a further display of some of what they've got on hand. Uh, just more than more than you could ever use in a lifetime. It's really incredible that uh, that these things survived. But as you know, they were they were probably placed in wooden crates, probably packed in straw or hay, and uh, were nestled in very nicely. Probably not a whole lot of uh, harsh activity that took place in the sinking of the ship so, or the boat. So when it went down and nestled in at the bottom, it, was, it just sat there and waited for the Hollies and their crew to come and find them again. In addition, there were lots of uh, uh, flasks and coffee pots and cooking ware and all kinds of a wash basin here and all kinds of things. They've got it displayed very nicely in the museum. It's easy to go around. I worried that I was going to miss something because I had my camera to my eye the whole time. But you see even these glass jars, uh, all kinds of nice uh, colored glass up here, just everything ready for setting up life on the prairie. Even I had never heard of what a salt dip was. I'm guessing that instead of a salt shaker, they had it more where you just dipped things into the salt. But it's amazing that not only the intricacy of the glass, but that everything survived and they have done taken such great care in displaying it all. These are knives and everything, all these pointed things you see here, those are forks, all set in for a display. And I think, yeah, spoons up here on top. And it's just, it's just incredible how many things they've got there. But 220 tons is a lot of stuff. Here are some of the, the boots and the shoes. Interesting thing, of, of the friend who had been down there told me this information. Many of these boots were not made as right foot and left foot. And I think I've got a picture coming up here that shows it even better. Yeah, you can see that there was, it was pretty much a round toe and that's the question I asked Dave when I saw him at the museum was why this happened. He said, well, you know, everything was very tightly watched. So things had to last a long time. If you switched the boot or the shoe from foot to foot, you wouldn't have as much 
wearing down or wearing out of the material. So you extended, therefore, the life of the boot because, you know, there's always that one spot in a shoe or a boot that wears out first. Uh, there are also some women's shoes. Some of them did have a little strap going across the heels to make sure that the, that the pairs stayed in place. Otherwise, uh, they just had to, to find them and put them in as pairs. This, I don't think this is what Dave was talking about. He said the Goodyear company, I don't see Goodyear on here, but this is a, a close up picture of the bottom of one of those boots that's on display. A really, really intricate. It's amazing how much work they put into all parts of the product. And, uh, it's, and to this day, it looks like it just came off the shelf. More clothing items. Uh, looks like these guys are ready to, to head downtown with, with their uh, dress hats, all kinds of fedoras and other pieces. So uh, just everything you could have ever wanted and needed for frontier life, including clothespins. You can't uh, wash all that nice clothes and have it dry and ready to go without getting it uh, on the clothesline. So barrels, I'm thinking some of these might be I'm trying to remember, oh, it is, they're pencils. Pencils here. So, and I think these up here is tobacco. These are cigars that were rolled and all ready to go uh, once, once you arrived at your destination. And more clothing with socks and a shirt. I play in a vintage baseball league, and this actually looks like it could be one of the, the jerseys for one of the teams that we play. Uh, these are probably like brass uh, buttons and pins for clothing items. But they've got just all kinds of thimbles. You want to make sure if you're sewing those things on that you've got a, a thimble so you don't uh, poke yourself with a needle. But you can see all kinds of intricate. These are, yeah, these are probably what, like little buckles where the, the pieces came together here uh, and pins. And you'll see, perhaps in the next one here, buttons. There were all kinds of buttons in different colors, different sizes, different configurations. Uh, so the, they were all ready to go on clothing or into general stores probably and then to be sold. Porcelain buttons from France and trade beads from Italy and Bohemia. So all kinds of great things. I mean, those are so tiny, you can hardly, Hardly keep them in your between your fingers, and of course you would need to uh, take care of the wood that was on the, or the trees that were on the the land that you were clearing out. So we've got hatchets and picks, and what amazes me is the the handles, the wooden handles here. I think they're hickory. Uh, they they all look like they could be put use put to use today. Uh, so it's just a, a great display of all of this these artifacts, as he said, largest collection of pre-Civil War artifacts anywhere. Uh, more the axes and the hatchets. Uh, and of course, if you're gonna build that house, you wanna secure it and you need doorknobs for the doors. We've got keys. These I'm guessing, these were kind of, they were all set up, so there must have been locks that went with the keys, either that or they were just a standard kind of key because I'm guessing not many people had them on the prairie. So a standard one was probably okay to use and still be safe. Uh, this is actually two pictures. On the left here, we've got fireplace shovels and wrenches. This was on the side of this, the display. And then over here, what's fun about this is this is uh, actually the woven hemp bag that contained the hemp rope. So you can see the, the bag was over the top and then there's just wound bits of, of rope. And sorry, I accidentally hit that. But uh, and then you've also got, I don't know if these are traps. It looks like you probably, you would probably need to do that as well. So all kinds of great stuff there. This is the glass and the window that Dave mentioned. This is the, the old style glass, so it wasn't, it isn't smooth. If you could see real close, you could see that it, that a wave, there's a wavy texture to it. Here in the middle of this left-hand picture, 
are those panes of glass that were stored in the boxes. So they were just kind of slid into racks and safely made the, the trip across. We've got on the left wall here, we've got some large hinges. We've also got some poles for drawers or for cabinets. Same thing here. You can go to Menards or Home Depot today and probably find pretty much the same thing. And all kinds of other hinges and materials down here. It, it's, it's just crazy what all was on that boat. I don't know about you, but it didn't look like it was all that big to me, but they sure did a good job. And oh, up here on the upper left, my brother and I were looking at those. They almost look like they could be skis, but we're guessing that they're probably arms for scales that would have been used on the farm to make sure that you're getting uh, the correct weights of everything. Here are some more keys across the bottom here. Uh, these look like they were, you can see if you look at the, the key heads here, they're all, God darn, I keep hitting that. Uh, they're all different. So there must have been specific locks, I would think, that went with each of those keys. And again, this is just a close up of that earlier picture. So you see doorknobs here. This almost looks like tar paper or something for the roofs and just all kinds of other supplies. This might even be like a bridle. I don't know, it looks kind of like a bridle for a horse, but a little small. But these panels for doors, you know, around the doorknob. So all kinds of supplies ready to go. This, these two here are those nails that I mentioned. They would have been stored in kegs and I'm guessing the, the keg probably broke and then the air hit the steel of the nails and they all merged together, all rusted together. Some great uh, decorative uh, the inside of us are a mantle, got a rolling pin for baking and all kinds of different things in various stages of, this is probably more the stuff that didn't, wasn't fully recoverable because you can see a lot of it is rusted and not quite uh, up, to, up to snuff. And then on the left here are those tobacco products. There's those cigars that I mentioned earlier and tobacco chew, the chews that came out of the kegs. And again, look at that rope. I'm sure they had to put a lot of work into cleaning that up, but it looks like it could be right down at the hardware store today. On the right-hand side are some books. Uh, Dave mentioned that the, the inside pages had all dissolved, but I'm guessing by the looks of things, these were leather. And there's something here that it mentioned Shakespeare. Yeah, Shakespeare. Uh, so these are books that would have been brought along and partially salvaged when the boat went down. So just, uh, and this lady, he mentioned that they have people who are on duty at all times continuing the uh, restoration of, of products. It's like, I'm guessing they don't get as much done as they actually get to talking to people. She was talking to us. I was wearing a mask that said Mankato Playhouse on it. She was talking away and then she said, well, I see you're from Minnesota. I said, well, how, how did you know that? Well, I saw the Mankato and one of the people, one of our most recent hires went to school at Minnesota State Mankato. So she recognized the name and she said, and if you continue on down uh, for her thesis project, she put together the children's display that you'll see down there on your left. And this is the one that she was referring to, it talks about children during the steamboat era, all kinds of great information. You do finish up the exhibit going down a, a hall that has these windows of displays of things that uh, might help fill in some of the, the gaps that you have after going through the exhibit. So that is the last slide that I've got. Uh, as Dave mentioned, easy to find, 1856.com is the website. The phone number has 1856 in it as well. And this is the email address that I sent to when I found out that Dave was the was the owner of the museum. And I figured, well, he will probably answer this email or somebody will direct it to him. So I just sent that there to attention Dave. And within about maybe 30 hours, I had a response back from Dave and I am an old newspaper reporter. So I had no problems just uh, 
hopping on the phone and giving Dave a call and setting up the interview for a few days down the road. So now, Doc, you said that you had been to the museum before. I'm wondering, uh, anything come back that you remember? You'll have to unmute yourself. Al, are you there? Maybe he had to wander off, but like I say, the, the museum is located right down at City Market, which is the older part of town. It's really very nice now. They've done a nice job of rehabbing it and the area around it has all kinds of specialty shops. And like I say, there was a great uh, barbecue restaurant that we went past on our way in. And if it hadn't been early in the morning, we would have probably gone in there for some food and we didn't stop there on our way back, but that is about all that I've got right now. Does anybody have any questions that I might be able to, to answer? I don't have any questions, but I have to tell you I've been there. Oh. And from the looks of your pictures, it appears that they have way more displayed than when we were there visiting it. Really? Oh, it's extremely interesting. I ended yeah. up buying some duplicate or whatever, buttons, okay. replica buttons that they had for sale. They are so adorable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they've got a, a gift shop. Of course, as any good museum is set up, it's set up so that when you get done and are exiting, you have to exit through the gift shop. Yes. So anything that you might have seen along the way that you want to especially remember, you can grab on your way out. How long ago were you down there, Joan? Oh, it's been many years. I can't even tell you how many years, but they do have way more displayed. I'm sure of it. Yeah, because they, they do continue to work. I'm guessing it's not all just that one person who's in the, the position in the, in the museum. They've probably got a crew of them working somewhere else. But uh, well, thank you, Penny. Uh, but uh, yeah, they've got all kinds of great things they will continue to work on. And as Dave mentioned, they're looking to expand to a different location because he, he seems like one of those guys who's just not, never going to stop. He's always going to have some project. And they must have been pretty successful, he and his, his brother and dad, because he said they didn't expect this would cost much money. I'm guessing with all of those pumps and everything else that they had to have running the entire time, that it probably got more expensive than they thought. Mike, I was just going to ask that if they had any information, you know, the time it took, but the cost, the number of people involved to do that, to restore the things, clean the ropes. Mm -hmm. And they obviously still have people there doing work. Um, anything on the costs or anything? I had not seen that, but the only thing, like I say, uh, they, they were supposed to be done by springtime. So it, it boggles my mind how they were able to do all of that work in a matter of a few months time, but nothing that I've read or that Dave has told me uh, would make me think that it was multiple years because I don't think they would have been able to maintain the integrity of that hole, like he said, yeah. through the springtime. Mm. But if I come across anything, Sandra, I'll certainly share it with you. Yeah, I'll go to the website too and look. Very, very interesting. Yeah, it was, a, it was a lot of fun. It was uh, one of our drivers here at Vine who had told me about it. And he's one of those guys who uh, remembers a lot of detail. So I, I had that uh, in my head as I, as I went through the museum. Yeah. Very interesting, Mike. Well, thank you, you Tom. Very good job. It, it's very nice when you can uh, go right to the source who's willing to talk about it in such great detail. You can tell he's told those stories on a couple of occasions because he told that story about photography and the fruit in the, the pie fillings when we talked down in Kansas City too. But you have to be that kind of guy to make it all uh, successful because it seems like they run it on not quite a shoestring but on a, a fairly low budget. On that day, let's see, we bought our tickets from one person. There was the person at the lab and Dave. I didn't see many more employees than that there. I'm sure they have to keep everything clean and uh, straightened up, especially during these times. But uh, right now on a daily basis, it's probably not that big of a uh, drain financially. 
Anybody else have any comments or questions? Thank you, Mike. That really was a great interview that you did. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah, 13, 13 years as a newspaper reporter, and I've done a lot of reporting since then. And I had a lot of information to, uh, to prompt. And knowing that Dave was a, a talker, it doesn't take much to get him going on a subject. <laughs> but thank you, Margaret. Well, you're welcome. Yeah. Anybody else?